is going to be focused uh, on an EEG based interaction and EEG based teaching is what is going to be followed. And it would not be, you know, a very extensive case scenario kind of presentation. But, you know, briefly what we will look at is in terms of description of occipital transients, trying to distinguish between both the epileptic form as well as the non-epileptic form transients and look at a small a few aspects with regard to social localization of occipital transients. And then we will look at the profile of transients seen in self-limiting occipital epilepsies, follow it up with symptomatic occipital epilepsies and end with certain case scenarios. So I'm sure you have already heard over the last few modules about epileptiform patterns and extratemporal focal epilepsies, frontal, central parietal temporal, uh, midline parietal, occipital, as well as multifocal. And the thing with regard to occipital transients is primarily based on the understanding the, of the fact that you have to take into consideration the surface anatomy and look into the aspects with regard to surface projection on an EEG. Because obviously, when you are reading the EEG, you have to take into consideration the inverse problem. So you have a result or a measurement which you have on a 2D surface that is the EEG. And Based on that, you have to make an interpretation of the 3D source from the actual topology of, of the brain from which the source is emanating from. So you have to take into consideration limitations of the inverse problem. Now, why this is relevant with regard to the occipital lobe anatomy is primarily the fact that if you look at the first diagram, that is the lateral surface of the brain showing the lateral occipital lobe in close relation to the temporoparieto occipital junction and the parieto occipital sulcus, you can see that the field of projections can be quite extensive. It can project very much anteriorly along the temporoparieto occipital region and often into the anterior as well as middle temporal region, primarily by virtue of propagation along the basal temporo-occipital regions, or it can project superficially or superiorly along the superior parietal lobule and subsequently onto the parietal channels as well as the central parietal channels. And often you can also see projections especially if a source is located within the medial basal temporal region. So the so diagram two shows the medial aspect of the occipital lobe. And you can see that surface projections from the medial basal temporal, medial basal occipital regions can project onto the parietal as well as of often onto the frontal regions. But primarily the distinction would be in terms of the fact that where you see the maximum amplitude of the particular transient is what is going to likely tell you that this is the likely source of origin. But there are certain pitfalls, as we will be seeing when it comes to interpretation of occipital transients, as Dr. Mendi Retta said, primarily by virtue of a representation which can be bilateral, a representation which can be quite anterior, extending along the temporoparieto occipital regions, and often ictal activity can be propagated along the medial temporal region. So you have an occipital activity or ictal rhythms originating from the occipital regions, which can spread superiorly along the parietal as well as frontal regions, as well as inferiorly or along the so-called infrasylvian regions along the temporal as well as the basitemporal occipital regions. And by virtue of that propagation, you can get a variability in the semiology. Those can mimic temporal lobe epilepsy, especially if these have an infrasylvian spread or spread along the basitemporal occipital regions, or can mimic extratemporal partial epilepsy with hypermotor manifestations, frequent secondary generalizations by virtue of frontal propagation. Now, if you look at a typical occipital transients, I need not tell this audience about what defines an epileptiform transients. You know very well that it should have stand out of the background, it should have an after coming slow, and it should have a field. And the thing about occipital transients is that on the bipolar derivation, they would appear to be surface positive, primarily because the occipital transients are the last electrodes or the last channels. When you look at the conventional system of electrode placement, that is the 1020 system of electrode placement, you realize that the occipital channels are the last. That is why negative transients, which emerge on that particular channel, often appear as surface positive because these often form input to within the differential amplification provided by the bipolar mon uh, montages. So in this particular example, you can see the example of these occipital transients, which are rhythmic transients. They're lasting more than three seconds. So they come uh, at a frequency of one to two per second, and they have a typical initial positive followed by a, a negative slow transient following that. 
And you can see that the maximum amplitude is over the right side in comparison to the left. This is aspect is particularly unique when it comes to nasal origin occipital transients because of the fact that they are bilaterally represented. And based on the difference in the amplitude between the two sides, on which you will be determined, you will which you will determine by placing it in the referential montage, you can probably hypothesize as to where or the lateralization of that transient is probably emerging from. But one peculiar problem that we often see with occipital transients is this phenomenon referred to as the end of chain phenomenon. As I was mentioning, the occipital channel is the last channel in the particular derivation that you are looking at. In this case, you can see the longitudinal or the bipolar derivation. And you can see these transients which have an initial positive uh, phase and then followed by a negative slow wave phase. And they are confined to the occipital channels. That is the O2 channel. And you are driving, you are basically looking for a field in this particular EEG. And you can see that the field is not very well seen. You are saying that the projection is the common electrode between T4O2 and T6O2 is O2. And when you see in the referential montage, you can see very well that possibly the field is appreciated best along the O2 channel and extending slightly along the P4 channel as well as the O1 channel. So if you need to look carefully in order to determine the field in the referential montage when it comes to both the beginning of chain as well as the end of chain phenomenon, in case of occipital transients, the end of chain phenomenon frequently applies. So the end of chain phenomena basically refers to the presence of the spikes in the single posterior most channel, which is the O1 or the O2 channel. The reason is to identify that this is an end of chain phenomenon is that these can be confused with the artifact. And you need to re often rely on other montages, such as the referential montages, the transverse montage, or the posterior height band to identify the field and the phase reversal. So as you can see in this particular example, you are seeing an occipital transient. Now you're lucky enough in this particular page to see that within the bipolar derivation, you are also able to appreciate the field of the T5O1, T3O1 projection to P4O2, as well as to T6O2, although this is of a much lower amplitude. And when you place this in the referential montage, you see that the origin is probably along the O1 electrode. So you can see that this channel is showing the maximum amplitude. And you can see that the, the amplitude is of a lower amplitude over O2 channels. And when you put this in the posterior hat band, which is nothing but the channels which are oriented along the a posterior aspect of the brain with a focus on the posterior cortex in this orientation, that is T3 to T5, T5 to O1, O1 to O2, O2 to T6, and o o T6 to T4, you can actually appreciate the phase reversal very well. So the field may not be very well seen here. The field was previously seen better in the bipolar as well as the referential derivation, but you can actually see the phase reversal in the between T5, O1, and O1, O2, indicating that the source is likely to be over O1. So this indicates that the posterior hat band or other derivations such as transverse derivations can be useful if you are you know, trying to say whether there is a logical field to a particular transient and you need not fall behind uh, when you identify an end of chain phenomenon and you need not be too worried whether you, when you want to make this differentiation between an end of chain spike versus an occipital transient due to an artifact such as a loose O1 or an O2 electrode. The concept of the field is extremely important in this case. So as you can see in this particular EG, apologies for the quality. Uh, you can see that this is a basically a awake to drowsy EG. The patient is partly awake and then you can see those transient wickets coming here. But what is primarily seen here are transients over the O2 channel, over the O1 channel. And this O1 channel, it is seen over both T3O1 as well as T5O1. And you can see in the referential montage, it is seen over a single electrode. Now, keep in mind the morphology of this particular transient. So you can see this transient has a spike. It appears to have an after coming slow, but the morphology is quite different from the previous transient, which I had shown you. And it seems to be confined to the oven channel alone. You are not able to appreciate the field very well. You put this into another montage, you can see the phase reversal, but you are not able to appreciate the field. So now you have three channel, the three montages, that is the bipolar derivation, followed by the common average reference montage, followed by the posterior hat branch, none of which shows you a comprehensive field. So this is most likely to be an urban artifact. And this is very well exemplified in the fact that this morphology of the discharge batch, which you are seeing in the O1 channel, looks like a definite pop 
you are not seeing a field, the morphology is like a pop, and you have not convinced yourself within looking at three montages, you are not able to appreciate the field in any way. So this is nothing but an O1 artifact. It is also important that you realize the physiological transients you are likely to encounter within the occipital region. So the physiological transients, as you can see in adolescence as well as in the, that is in young children, you often see these transients which stand out of the alpha activity and often followed by the slow waves. And these are nothing but slow waves of youth. It does not disturb the subsequent background. And these are normal physiological transients which you can see uh, and typically in young children and uh, in uh, older children and adolescents. There is another pattern which you can see once a person closes his or her eyes after scanning the environment. And this pattern, which is rarely seen, is often referred to as the fire rhythm. So you can see this pattern often resembles as a spike and wave pattern. You are able to appreciate the field. It merges very well with the alpha. Typically, it can be uh, the surface negative and is followed by an after coming slow. The important thing is that it happens in the first three to four seconds of eye closure and is followed by the alpha activity and it does not evolve. And this typically happens when the person closes his eyes after the scanning the environment. Similarly, once the person is actively scanning the environment, it is possible that you might see certain occipital transients as you can see here indicated by the arrows. And these are primarily negative transients which are seen over bilateral uh, uh, centro parieto occipital regions as well as over the temporo occipital regions and these are very tiny low amplitude the important thing is that once you place this into the referential montage you are likely to see an initial positive phase as is seen with positive occipital sharp transients of sleep so this is an example of typical post so the equivalent of post during wakefulness is lambda it happens during active scanning of the environment whereas posts are seen primarily during sleep. And you can see that these have an initial uh, negative phase. And the important way you would differentiate it from uh, epileptiform transients is the fact that these have an initial positive phase, as you can see here on O1 as well as O2 channels, you can appreciate the initial positive phase. And you differentiate this from occipital spikes. So as you can see here, this is an example of an occipital transient seen over bilateral occipital regions during uh, drowsiness. And once you place this in the referential montage or you shift to the referential montage, you can see these transients have an initial negative phase and a typical spike wave appearance. So these are bilateral occipital spikes. And contrast that to the, uh, you can see where I'm placing my arrows here. I hope you can see the arrows as well. You can see that these are initial positive phases, which you would see with posts. So you have occipital epileptiform transients coexisting with posts within the same EG, typically seen during drowsiness. So it is important to differentiate this from physiological transients seen both during wakefulness and sleep. You also need to make distinctions from certain benign variants, which you see during the EEG. So in this particular example, you can see that the person uh, is a drowsy and you can see these uh, rhythmic activity emerging over uh, the right occipital region, right temporoparieto occipital region rather, they have a very monomorphic appearance. And if you place this in the referential montage, they have a typical comb-like appearance. And these are often referred to as tenoids. They occur typically in phase stage one, stage two of sleep. They disappear in the deeper stages of sleep. They often appear at around the ages of four to six years. And they are seen well often into adulthood. And you can see that they can demonstrate considerable asymmetry. They may appear more prominent over one hemisphere in comparison to the other side. And this is what is often referred to as the 14 and 6 hertz positive uh, transients or the tenoids or the comb-like patterns that you would see. And typically, they have a frequency of 14 hertz. And occasionally, you can also get monomorphic discharges, which appear at a frequency of 6 hertz have a prominence over the parieto occipital regions, again, having a comb-like appearance, but they are of a lower frequency in comparison to the previous example, 14 hertz frequency versus a six hertz frequency. So 14 and six hertz positive spikes are an important differential seen typically in the sleep and disappear in the deeper stages of sleep, never seen during wakefulness. Another pattern which emerges often over the occipital regions and as is typically seen in the elderly or in older adults and often can mimic an ictal rhythm is this pattern referred to as subclinical rhythmic electroencephalographic discharges of adults. As you can see here, 
In this particular subject, who is an older adult, there is normal alpha activity and you're seeing a run-up of rhythmic monomorphic theta frequency activity over the occipital regions. It, it seems to show a tendency to evolve, but typically it is seen on, it may start on one side, but typically it spreads to both sides and it does not really cause a significant slowing of the background activity. Later on, you would see the alpha activity emerge. You would not see a change in the clinical state of the patient. And this often is considered to be an electrographic seizure activity, but in reality, this is a benign transient, which is seen in a significant uh, subset of normal adults, particularly in the elderly age group. And this is referred to as SRIDA. So this is a pattern also, which is rarely seen, but it has also been recently described in children. This has to be differentiated from a dynamic evolving pattern, which is an ictal rhythm, which you often see in patients with occipital lobe epilepsy. Now, the problem with often with occipital lobe epilepsy is that ictal rhythms can appear very diffuse. They may be marked with sudden diffuse attenuation. And you can see that in comparison to this monomorphic pattern, you have a very dynamic pattern seen with regard to an ictal rhythm in occipital epilepsy. So you can see that here, you have initial background activity and you are seeing a diffuse attenuation followed by low voltage fast activity, which is seen over bilateral occipital region, which changes in frequency subsequently to theta range. Then the theta range activity evolves over the left more than right occipital regions as seen in the referential montage. You can see that the asymmetry of evolution is better seen over the left in comparison to right. And then it again changes into a faster frequency, which is a beta range. And you can see it evolves later, later in the second last uh, few seconds along the left more than right occipital regions. So a dynamic change, spread of activity from one region to another region and a disturbance of the background as well as a change in the clinical state of the patient. This patient had versal seizures with eye deviation is what would mark an ictal rhythm. And often it may not be easy with regard to occipital lobe epilepsy to localize or lateralize the onsets. Other physiological transients which you often get is with photic stimulation and you know very well that photic stimulation can lead to photic drives and in some cases you can also get what, some, what is referred to as shown in this figure, a grade 1 photoparoxysmal response. You can see that the, the rhythmic activity that you are seeing over the occipital channels is not time locked typically to the uh, stimulation frequency. And you can see that these have a frequency which is slightly variable. So these can be considered as whether these are in harmonics, that is in at slower frequencies or faster frequency of that photic stimulation, or whether this is a grade one photoparoxysmal response if it is consistent. And grade one photoparoxysmal response is now known to be a completely normal phenomenon. So what are the occipital stimulus dependent responses? You can get stimulus dependent responses which are limited to the stimulus train that is based on the stimulation frequency or these can be self-sustaining. That is after you stop stimulating the frequency, if that activity is known to persist and it shows a spread from one region to another, it can be considered to be a grade one to two photoparoxysmal response. Now, coming to occipital epileptiform patterns, as you can see very well, it is important to know the 1020 system of electrode placement and you realize that what is often considered to be occipital lobe origin has a surface projection which can be quite widespread along the posterior temporal regions, that is T5 or T6, or the parietal regions, P3, P4, or often along the midline PZ and often CZ. And when the activity is more diffuse, it can spread along the hemisphere and can often become generalized. So what are the causes of occipital seizures? I need not tell this particular audience. You would need to obviously differentiate this from the self-limiting phenotypes from the so-called structural, metabolic, autoimmune, or immune-mediated, post-infectious, or unknown etiologies. And often you have acute symptomatic seizures that persons who present with new onset epilepsy following an acute insult, such as posterior reversible leukoencephalopathy, following hypertensive hemorrhage or hypertensive encephalopathy, or other causes such as strokes. And very often these can present with focal occipital discharges, which can often be periodic to pseudoperiodic or lateralized. Now, one of the important aspects with, when it comes to occipital epileptiform transients is that Apart from the fact that it can be appear more widespread or posterior temporal, bilateral expression is very common. And this is often because of the fact that foci, which originate from the medial occipital regions, 
or the deep calcarine fissure or often the basal occipital regions are difficult to detect. So that is why the surface projections are often bilateral. So as shown in this particular example, you can see that the surface EG shows evidence of bilateral parieto occipital discharges. You can see the maximum amplitude is in fact along the midline regions, that is the midline parietal, midline occipital regions. And you can see the surface projection also over P3 average as well as P4 average regions. So you can see, so you are in no position to really localize or lateralize based upon the topology of this dis discharge. Now, if you do a spectral analysis and look at the surface mapping, you can see that the activity is in fact localized better along the left parieto occipital regions. Once you go one step further, so now mind you that the surface projection here appears to suggest a left lateralized or a left parieto occipital origin of the discharge. Keep in mind the inverse problem. Take you to now to the source localization or attempted source localization. There are so many softwares available such as S. Loretta. This is one particular software referred to as music software. And in this, the surface projection indicated that the transient is over the right medial occipital region. And this seemed to commensurate with the MRI evident abnormality, which is seen over the right medial occipital region. So you can see the activity on the surface EG seem to suggest a pseudo lateralization to the left side, but in actuality is following the source localization, it is very clearly originating. This was subsequently proven to be originating from the right medial occipital regions. As you can see, this GC basically indicates electrodes which were placed during intracerebral recordings over both homologous regions on the right side and the left side. And this is where the ictal activity was found to be detected. And the patient was subsequently underwent epilepsy surgery and was rendered seizure free. So these kind of bilateral expressions, false localizations and false lateralization should be anticipated, particularly when you have mesial occipital or deep calcarine origin of these epileptiform transits. Another interesting phenomenon that, as we will see further, also involves the detection of a particular form of reflex sensitivity seen with occipital epilepsies, particularly with idiopathic or the self-limiting occipital epilepsies, which is fixation of sensitivity. But mind you, this has been reported also with symptomatic epilepsies, particularly in those patients with bilateral parieto occipital pathologies, such as bilateral parieto occipital gliosis, pachygyria, or major malformations of cortical development. I'll run briefly through the self-limiting uh, occipital epilepsies, and I will not be going into too much clinical details, focusing primarily on the EG. And you can see here that now there are well-defined criteria to delineate this entity of self-limiting early childhood occipital or autonomic epilepsy, which is often referred to as cellars. Previously, it used to be referred to as paniotopolis syndromes, where patients can often present as discognitive status epilepticus with autonomic phenomenon, which can often last for minutes to hours and can present as afebrile, non-convulsive status epilepticus. And typically these children are developmentally normal and often the onset is between three to eight years of age. Now the EG in such cases often shows high amplitude, focal or multifocal discharges, which have an occipital predilection. And occipital spikes are often seen in more than 40% in the first year, uh, less than 40% during the first EG. And once you increase the recordings and include a sleep record, you can increase the yield to 75%. And the important thing is that unilateral focal discharges can be seen across serial EEG and it should not you know, take you away from the diagnosis of a self-limiting focal epilepsy if the history is very typical. So this is an example of a child who was, uh, uh, you know, had infrequent episodes of nocturnal focal non-motor seizures with facial twitching and vomiting. And the EEG, the awake EEG shows you an end of chain spike over the right uh, occipital region. And if you look carefully over the left central region, and you see during the sleep record the marked activation of bilateral temporoparieto occipital transients. As you can see, they show a phase reversal over T5 O1 as well as T6 O2, as well as uh, uh, over P4 O2, if you see this particular region. And now, if you place this in the referential montage, you can actually demonstrate that the maximum negative. Activity is over the temporo-occipital regions bilaterally, slightly more on the left in comparison to the right. And interestingly, with self-limiting occipital epilepsies, you can also get the phenomenon of a tangential dipole, where you see a surface positivity over T3 and a surface negativity over T5 O1. So what appeared to be a, a definite point of phase reversal here, if you can see, is probably best seen here as a dipole. 
So this is what is referred to as a tangential dipole, which you often associate with benign childhood, so-called benign childhood epilepsies or the self-limiting childhood epilepsies with centrotemporal spikes is also a real phenomenon or in self-limiting occipital epilepsies where the dipole is often seen over the posterior temporal or often over the parieto occipital regions as well. Now, coming to the late childhood occipital epilepsies, what are now referred to as the childhood occipital visual epilepsies, where, as Professor Mendiratha was saying, patients present to you with, with either elementary visual auras or often complex visual auras if they are temporoparieto occipital in origin. And typically, these patients have focal onset seizures with head version, and very rarely they present with uh, non convulsive status epilepticus as opposed to the Peniatopolis syndrome or the self limiting uh, or the cellars. And uh, it is very unlikely that these patients will present to you as non-convulsive status, but they can present to you with clustering of events. And they are not associated with other phenotypes like drop attacks, regression, atypical absences, myoclonus, et cetera. And there should not be any field defect on examination. They are normally developing older children or teenagers. And these are some of the colored auras or the elementary visual auras, which are often described uh, extremely colorful auras, which are drawn by the patients. And the EGs are often accompanied by Spittal spikes and both during wakefulness and sleep. And often they can also be the centrotemporal, frontal, or generalized in about 20%. And the background activity should be typically normal. But one interesting phenomenon that you see is this phenomenon of fixation of sens sensitivity, where the moment the subject closes the eyes, you see the occipital paroxysms over bilateral occipital regions that persist throughout the period of the eyes closed state and attenuate once the subject opens the eyes. So you can see this is typified in this example of a monozygotic twin family with a visual sensitive occipital epilepsy. And you can see here that this shows that upon eye closed state, you see what starts as low voltage fast activity is accompanied by occipital paroxysms that often become generalized and persist, important, persist throughout the period of the eyes closed state and attenuate during eye opening and reappear in the eyes closed state. And it should be a fairly consistent response to call this as eyes closed sensitivity. Similarly, you can also elicit fixation of sensitivity once you place a white paper in front of the eye or interrupt fixations by using a frenzel lenses, which are prismatic lenses with the uh, apex towards the uh, medial aspect of the orbit. You can interrupt the fixation. And once you interrupt the fixation, it is possible you can elicit the same pattern of discharges. And once you do that particular task, you are eliciting fixation of sensitivity. You can also elicit scotosensitivity in some of these subjects where irrespective of the eyes closed state, that is irrespective whether the eyes are open or eyes are closed, you can see activation of occipital paroxysms as shown here over P3 as well as P3 O1. And you can see that irrespective of the eyes open or the eyes closed state, the paroxysms of spike wave discharges continue to persist over the occipital regions and they, they sort of disappear once you switch on the lights in the subject. It is also important to differentiate this from eye closure sensitivity because of the fact that, you know, <clears throat> these eye closure sensitivity is more typically a genetic generalized epilepsy or G1 syndrome. And it is basically comprises of eyelid myoclonia with or without absences along with photosensitivity. And the way you differentiate eye closure from eye closed, eye closure being a signature of G1 syndrome, the way you differentiate it is based upon the fact that you see these transients being activated in the first three seconds of eye closure and they are not activated subsequently. Whereas in the eyes closed state, they are present throughout the period of the eyes closed state. And they, uh, uh, they sort of attenuate when you open the eyes. Another close accompaniment of this eye closure sensitivity is this particular entity that is idiopathic photosensitive occipital epilepsies. Again, patients often present as visually sensitive. They are sensitive to television viewing, video game viewing, flickering sunlights. And they often experience these sensory symptoms, which include lights, colored spots, often visual hallucinations that migrate from one hemifield to the other hemifield. They can often be prolonged and they can progress into generalized tonic clonic seizures. And typically, they are seen in normally, normally uh, developing children as well as uh, normal adults. And occipital spikes are often precipitated by both eye closure as well as intermittent photic stimulation. And some of these patients can also be visual sensitive in terms of having occipital paroxysms being activated by the eyes closed state or being photosens uh, scotosensitive. 
and they can overlap with certain Ig features such as myoclonic seizures, absences, and GTCS, and prominently exhibit a very prominent photoparoxysmal response as seen in this particular example. You can see that the photoparoxysmal response in this particular subject emanates from the occipital region. So you can see that the occipital transients have a polyspike morphology that spreads anteriorly, and importantly, they outlast the stimulus strain. So this is often referred to as a grade four photoparoxysmal response because of the fact that it becomes generalized and it outlasts the stimulus strain. And this, as you can see in the referential montage, the transients are of maximum amplitude over the pyrito-occipital regions as well as temporo-occipital regions before it becomes generalized. And this patient also has intrictal activity, which is over confined to the occipital, re temporo occipital regions. You can see that these have a polyspike morphology. They can be unilateral or bilateral, and often they are accompanied by generalized discharges. So bilateral polyspikes are also noted in patients with idiopathic photosensitive occipital epilepsy. One of the core issues which we often encounter is distinguishing this from a symptomatic occipital lobe epilepsy. So as you would have heard in the previous talk, both in terms of self-limiting childhood epilepsies with centrotemporal spikes or focal epilepsies or frontal, parietal or temporal origin. The core feature is identifying background abnormalities in terms of change of the background activity, as well as identifying the topology or the source of the particular transient that you are seeing. So this particular EEG is of a patient who had bilateral parietal occipital gliosis. You can see the occipital transient seen over the left side. And importantly, the, what you can see is different is in the fact that you are seeing asynchronous slowing over the left parieto occipital region. So over P301 in comparison to P402, the left side appears to be slower. And also, if you see, you can see that the temporal regions are uh, also exhibiting the same slowing. So in general, you have a diffuse background abnormality, which is more so over the left in comparison to the right. And at the same time, you are seeing these transients over the occipital region. So presence of background abnormalities in terms of background slowing, apart from the presence of these spikes, is what can help you to differentiate between idiopathic and symptomatic. Another core feature which we find useful, particularly with some of the MR-negative refractory occipital lobe epilepsy phenotypes, who do not exhibit any reflex sensitivity or um, uh, you know, visual sensitivity, is the presence of these focal polyspikes. They are very useful for localization and lateralization. And you can see this activity, which when it is prolonged for more than three seconds, and it is beta range, if you see actually this uh, rhythmic transients, which are a beta range activity lasting for more than three seconds and terminate with slowing of the background or attenuation of the background. So similar to generalized paroxysmal activity, with occipital transients, you can also get focal paroxysmal fast activity, which is confined to the temporoparieto occipital regions. And this is another useful marker, which is often seen with symptomatic occipital lobe epilepsy. In this particular case, you can also see the presence of background abnormalities over the right side, in addition to this focal burst of uh, paroxysmal fast activity over the left temporoparieto occipital regions. You're also seeing background dysrhythmia over the right parieto occipital region temporoparieto occipital region. So you know that this is a symptomatic occipital epilepsy. And in the referential montage, you can see that because of the reference contamination, the discharge, which you thought was confined to the temporoparieto occipital region, appears to be much more hemispheric and appears to spread anteriorly. And this is because of the phenomenon of reference contamination, as you can see very well, that the activity is still temporoparieto occipital in origin. So some of the EEG exclusions for self-limiting occipital epilepsy are the presence of focal background abnormalities, paroxysmal fast activity of one side in accompaniment with these background activities, focal rhythmic spikes in accompaniment with these background abnormalities, and of course, EEG features which can resemble that of an epileptic encephalopathy. So often with uh, hip arrhythmia as well as modified hip arrhythmia subtypes, you can see that the multifocal discharges have a preponderance for the occipital region. So you can see in this particular case of the CDKL5 encephalopathy who presented to us with West syndrome, you can see here transients over bilateral occipital regions as well as over the anterior regions, that is over the frontal regions. And you can see that the background appears to be completely chaotic and disorganized, interrupted by multifocal spikes, which have a predilection for the occipital region. And these are also accompanied by generalized discharges. You can see here the generalized bursts associated with some decrement of background activity consistent with an epileptic encephalopathy. So these are obvious EEG exclusions for the diagnosis self-limiting and should, should fall as exclusionary criteria and should be considered in uh, uh, epileptic encephalopathies. 
Now, I'll just end with a few interesting case scenarios. So here you have a person who has a right to occipital gliosis, was admitted for video EG, underwent uh, pre-surgical evaluation. You can see that the transients seen in this particular subject appear to be diffuse, but more so over the left hemisphere. And if you look specifically, it is more so well distributed over the left temporal parieto occipital regions. There are additionally generalized discharges. And you can see that the, these are often accompanied by, by, accompanied by not only the left sided discharges, but also the generalized discharges, which have a morphology of generalized paroxysmal fast activity. And importantly, while the ictal semiology did seem to suggest a right temporoparieto occipital origin, the ictal rhythm, as you can see here, was characterized by a burst of a left hemispheric discharge, followed by low voltage fast activity that was evolving over bilateral occipital regions. Now, what is it that you rely on? Do you rely on that burst or do you rely on the change in frequency? So the important thing is that you look at where the fast activity is emerging from first. And you can see that the fast activity, irrespective of the burst, the fast activity is a fast recruiting rhythm, which is seen over the right uh, parieto occipital region, followed by a left hemispheric burst. And then the evolution is subsequently better over the left in comparison to the right side. So this aspect can be challenging when it comes to analysis of ictal rhythms in occipital lobe epilepsy, because the discharges can be false lateralizing, you can get false lateralizing pattern, false localizing pattern, and it requires a establishment of a concordance with the ictal semiology and between the ictal semiology and EG to really decide as to whether the subject is to be offered a right temporoparieto occipital lobectomy. In this case, the child was offered epilepsy uh, surgery in the form of a right parieto occipital lesionectomy, and the patient was doing well. This example is primarily to show you how an extratemporal focus can project over a wider area, or that is the temporoparieto occipital regions, can project along the occipital regions. And this is an example of a child who presented to us with unprovoked generalized seizures, followed by atonic head drops with tonic seizures and then gelastic spells, and presented in a situation which was similar to that of an epileptic encephalopathy. So daily atonic and tonic drop attacks, reduction in fluency with scholastic regressions in six months. And you can see the MRI shows evidence of a very clear focal particle dysplasia over the left superior parietal lobule. But look at the EEG of this child. So this EEG shows the evidence of very clear bilateral temporal parieto occipital discharges. You can see here phase reversal over T5 as well as over T6 O2. Importantly, bilaterally represented here. And you can see that in sleep, this has a feature suggestive of an epileptic encephalopathy. So the bilateral temporoparieto occipital discharges with frequent secondary bilateral synchrony, interrupting the sleep architecture, amounting to an electrical status epilepticus of sleep. So remember that electrical status epilepticus of sleep can have a frontal predominant pattern or an occipital predominant pattern. In this case, this patient had a symptomatic uh, CSWS or a symptomatic electrical status epilepticus of sleep and the patient was offered surgery and subsequently did well. The ictal pattern as I was mentioning in this particular case also was very poorly localized and lateralized in the initial part but if you look at the evolution of the ictal rhythm you can see very clearly the fast evolution seen over the left parieto occipital channel. On the right side it is marred by artifact but in compare between P3 O1 as well as P4 O2 and you can see that the focal fast activity is a dynamic ictal rhythm which is evolving along the left parieto occipital region with secondary bilateral synchrony which correlated with a tonic drop seizure which was seen in this particular girl and the child did well after surgery. So just to reaffirm with regard to ictal rhythms, lateralized onsets are often seen in patients with neocortical temporal lobe epilepsy with lateral occipital pathologies. Very often, you can get to see uh, lateralized ictal patterns, but typically generalized onsets can be seen with mesial frontal as well as occipital epilepsy. So with regard to you know, mislocalization and wrong localization or wrong localization and lateralization, and this particular study showed that it could have been noted in roughly 28% of occipital and 16% of parieto occipital seizures. So you're indicating that these regions are prone for this degree of false localization or false lateralization. This example was of a girl who presented with multiple seizure types, history of myoclonus, regression of milestones, had a clinical diagnosis of progressive myoclonus epilepsy. You can see the background abnormalities. There is a diffuse slowing of the background, delta range activity seen over bilateral, uh, uh, over both the hemispheres, 
And you can see the transients primarily over the right more than left occipital regions. You can see that these are primarily, they have surface positive transients. And you can see that with stimulation at a low frequency of photic, uh, intermittent photic stimulation, that is at a frequency of one hertz, you are seeing activation of these discharges, which are nothing but occipital dominant generalized discharges. So generalized discharges, which appear to have an occipital preponderance. And these are nothing but low frequency activation of photoperoxysmal response at one hertz frequency, very characteristic signature of neuronal serial lipofuscinosis type 2. So this another example of showing, you know, this one hertz frequency activating these occipital and often generalized discharges. Now, this is an example of a three-month-old girl who presented to us with blinking of eyes, as well as recurrent focal onset discognitive seizures with eye deviation to one side in accompaniment with myoclonic seizures. So this patient had a possible combined focal and generalized epilepsy with associated developmental delay. And you can see here that the interactal activity is characterized by occipital paroxysms over bilateral occipital regions. But importantly, this child is also photosensitive. So you can see that on photic stimulation, as well as on eye closure. So if you look at, look at this particular sub subject, the patient had eyelid myoclonia on eye closure, activation of occipital paroxysms over bilateral occipital regions, which tends to become generalized on photic stimulation. And you can see that this patient had a phenomenon of a refractory eyelid myoclonia with absence, which in accompaniment with developmental delays, often due to a genetic etiology. So remember that when it comes to reflex activated occipital transients, these are often now known to be due to certain genetic variants. So we have shown that some of these can be due to novel variants in this chromodomain holicase DNA binding protein 2, that is CSD2, in which the patient can have prominent eye closed sensitivity as well as photosensitivity, or they can be photosensitive as seen in patients with Dravet syndrome. So this patient had an intronic variant which led to a deletion or a truncating mutation, and this patient had evidence of mobile phone-induced myoclonic jerks and this mobile phone induced myoclonic jerks, as you can see while viewing the mobile phone, was characterized by occipital dominant bursts of generalized discharges, which correlated with the myoclonic jerks. Also note that occipital paroxysms can be seen on viewing certain patterns. So you can have pattern sensitive epilepsy, where typically on viewing certain patterns, so you have various patterns, typically pattern three and pattern five, which is, as well as the zigzag pattern or the pattern four, which are very highly epileptogenic patterns. And on view, this patient had evidence of photosensitivity, as well as pattern sensitivity on viewing various patterns. And this pattern sensitivity was evident in the form of occipital dominant generalized discharges. And also you can get eating epilepsy, which has a posterior cortex predominance. So occipital seizures can accompany persons who have eating reflex seizures. This patient had evidence of a left temporoparieto occipital uh, gliosis involving the dominant angular gyrus. And you can see the presence of focal paroxysmal fast activity involving the left temporoparieto occipital regions. And you can see that during the eating, you're seeing a very definite, well-defined, localized or lateralized ictal rhythm manifesting as fast activity, which evolves into spike wave discharges along the left temporoparieto occipital regions. So reflex components are also well known with regard to occipital epilepsies. So the key messages from this talk are that it is important you differentiate, you, keeping in mind the inverse problem, as well as the very basic concept of what an epileptiform transient is to differentiate between an occipital epileptiform transient versus a physiological transient versus an artifact versus benign variants. I often encourage the residents to define these transients as epileptiform last and take the other way. Why is it not a physiological transient? Why is it not an artifact? Why is it not a benign variant? And then conclude as to whether this is an occipital epileptiform transient. Remember, these can be bilaterally represented, often false localized, can be accompanied by focal fast activity. They have a wide field of projection, can express themselves over the temporoparieto occipital, centroparietal regions, and they are often accompanied by reflex triggers, particularly light stimulation or fixation of, and also situations such as eating. Keep these in mind when you are viewing these transits. Thank you. Thank you, Ram Shekhar, for very crisp, I'll say crystal clear, and informative talk on occipital transient. But many times when you are doing on the bedside, maybe because of uh, uh, less experience or being in hurry, many of these patterns like oh, you have shown that fast wave activity may be passed off, this is beta activity, but why should beta activity be there in occipital region? 
So all those things side. you must debate and definitely look for physiological variants one should know to find out the abnormality on the graph, which can be very informative. But once again, I will say, very important to know the clinical details. EG should not be reported in isolation, clinic, because EG is of that person who has some problem. So we must have clinical correlates with the electrophysiological correlates to give a good diagnosis and management strategy. So with this, uh, thank you so much, Ramshekhar. Once again, it was a beautiful talk. And uh, uh, there, there are some questions. Pretty, pretty good question. Yeah. Yeah, Manjari, carry on. So, uh, Dr. Ram, there's one question by Dr. Nikita Sen, who's asking, what is the difference between OIDA and... and yeah, I think Madam is uh, disconnected. Yeah, the difference between OIDA and fire rhythm. So, uh, OIDA is, in fact... More uh, you showed the... Uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Yeah, so now... Uh, Orida is uh, more commonly seen in comparison to phi. Phi is, in fact, a rarer finding. The reason I showed phi is because of the fact that, you know, that initial negative phase can appear like a spike. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll just take you to this. Are you able to see the page? Yes. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the Orida, which you see either physiologically in children or in children with uh, childhood absence, epilepsy, does not show you this, uh, although it is monomorphic, it is rhythmic, it is delta. The important thing is this tiny transient, which is a low voltage transient. Look, uh, this was at a sensitivity of 10, uh, 15. And it uh, you can see that if you see it at a standard sensitivity of seven, this would be quite prominent. And it was seen consistently. Uh, so this is a pattern which is accompanied by a tiny negative transient, which you don't see with OIRIDA. So the presence of the tiny negative transient is, and typically it happens in that initial phase of eye closure. Uh, after uh, the person has scanned the environment, you close the eyes. It is a rare finding in comparison to OIRIDA. OIRIDA, you see it more often with children as well as in absences. And, you're, and as in your lab, you are more likely to encounter OIRIDA rather than fire rhythm. But you just need to know this entity so that you don't mistake this. This is similar to this entity of uh, pattern-induced negative occipital potentials, which you can get on pattern viewing also. This has been described by Dr. Radhakrishnan. That is the pinops. And the morphology resembles like this, very tiny negative potentials, which are seen when you're viewing the patterns. And um, it can also resemble that of occipital spikes of blindness. You know, in patients who are blind, congenitally blind, if you do the EG, you can have these low voltage transients over the occipital region. They do not are not often accompanied by this kind of an after coming slow wave. They are very tiny uh, negative transients. Thank you, uh, Dr. Ram. There's another question by uh, Mr. Sachin. Why occipital lobe seizures often can mimic frontal lobe? So I. Uh, I assume that, you know, uh, Mr. Sachin is referring to the fact that, you know, they can present with versus seizures with eye deviation and all. So now the thing is that uh, the versus seizures that you get with frontal lobe epilepsy because of active of the frontal eye field area can very well be seen in patients with occipital lobe epilepsy. But the thing is that with occipital seizures, uh, the versive component often happens because of that propagation anteriorly. And uh, it can be ipsiversive or controversial. Ipsiversive, if it uh, is because of propagation along the parietal regions, because of activation of the parietal eye field area, it can be ipsiversive. Controversive, if it propagates to the frontal region. So as I was telling you earlier, the occipital lobe source can have a propagation suprasylvian along uh, across to the uh, frontal region or to the temporoparietal occipital junction or infrasylvian, it can go along the temporal and mimic a temporal lobe seizure. So it can not only mimic a frontal lobe seizure, it can mimic a temporal lobe seizure. It is very unlikely it will it will mimic a primary motor seizure because of the fact that the primary motor seizures are very distinctive. But yes, because by virtue of the suprasylvian spread, it can mimic a frontal lobe onset and uh, uh, a parietal lobe onset as well. And you know that both the parietal as well as occipital regions can serve, uh, it can pro propagate differentially by virtue of infrasylvian or suprasylvian spread. 
and uh, you, it is often difficult to you know, you know more difficult to localize parietal lobe seizures in comparison to occipital lobe seizures as dr mehndi ratha was alluding to the history of visual auras is extremely important and ictal nystagmus is an important finding which we often see in patients with occipital lobe seizures so you can see that ictal nystagmus in uh, now because of the scope of the talk i have not included any videos but typically you see a slow pursuit and a fast saccadic component with the eye deviation seen in patients resembling a nystag uh, mimicking a nystagmus and what happens is that the or the lobe of origin is often contralateral to the saccadic phase of the nystagmus. So the presence of ictal nystagmus is one feature which you can use to differentiate it uh, occipital lobe from the frontal, apart from the visual auras. And many of these persons can also appreciate an eye pulling sensation to one side. This is another aspect which you can use to differentiate occipital from frontal. So other thing is, Ram, if along with the eye deviation, there is abduction of the hand, or there is a facial contraction, then also that helps us differentiate whether it is just occipital or it is something more than, uh, you know, occipital. So, um, particularly if the subject is aware of it. I mean, yeah, yeah. Uh, if, the, if the subject is more aware of the fact, yeah, yeah. Uh, it is more specific for frontal or a primary, yeah. you know, supplementary motor area, primary motor area. So, there's another question by Dr. Rajshri. Um, she she's asking what is the mechanism of eye closure sensitivity in focal onset seizures of uh, occipital origin? Why why the, why does this phenomenon happen? Yeah. So now what is now known uh, is that this has to do with the activation of uh, the levator palpebrae superioris from the so you have an occipital focus. So now there is an inherent either genetic tendency which activates the occipital regions. The moment you close the eyes, what happens is that the levator palpebrae superioris activates the mesencephalic reticular formation. And that often serves as a reflex trigger for the activation of the epileptiform transients. So this is one concept which has come with regard to uh, <laughs> the G1 syndrome. And this is what one feature which offers to a considerable overlap between G1 syndrome and photosensitive occipital epilepsy. What was initially thought I'll, uh, using this experiments on photosensitive baboons is that the reflex eyelid myoclonia that you get is because of this occipital Rolandic activity. So it is an extra occipital sensitivity because the uh, by virtue of stimulation of the motor cortex, you can often get the eyelid myoclonia. But then subsequently it was shown from human models that, I mean, not from human models, based on animal interpretations and then from clinical experience was that you have activation of the levator palpebrae superioris based upon spread of ictal activity from the occipital lobe along the brain stem through the mesencephalic reticular formation into the levator palpebrae superioris, which is why you get the eyelid myoclonia. Eye closure sensitivity is nothing but a form of photosensitivity where in the first few seconds of that transition from light to darkness, that is the first three seconds of transition from light to darkness, you get that activation. So many of the, or, or most of these patients are inherently photosensitive. And FOSS, on the other hand, that is interruption of fixation is believed to be a similar mechanism where the occipital lobe, particularly the magnocellular regions of the occipital lobe are known to be more sensitive to changes of uh, light perception. And this is what often activates. And remember that FOSS is not seen only with idiopathic, but also symptomatic. So those patients who have bilateral occipital lesions, pachygyria or malformations of cortical development can experience the same entity primarily because of the uh, inherent hyperexcitability of the occipital lobe. Uh, I suspect that we are yet to Id identify the complete genetic basis of uh, eye closure sensitivity. Uh, although we have you know, certain genetic phenotypes such as CSD2, there is no particular mechanism to really pinpoint to. But the extra occipital photosensitivity has now been what was thought to be original was, uh, has now been replaced by the concept of occipital photosensitivity with rostral with caudal propagation along the brainstem. Uh, thank you for the exhaustive explanation, Ram. Uh, there's another question here. Uh, I'll ask the EEG based questions. Uh, so. Can you explain the difference between paroxysms due to eye closure in Jeevan syndrome? and other self-limited occipital lobe epilepsies. Okay, so the core difference is the fact that eye closure is in the first three seconds and the eyes closed sensitivity is throughout the period of the eyes closed state. So now if I take you to the page to make it more clear, 
Um, okay, so this is the uh, eye closed uh, sensitivity. When you close the eyes throughout the period of the eyes closed state, you see these occipital uh, spike wave discharges, which uh, I'm not sure if you're able to see it on the screen, they attenuate on eye opening. Whereas in eye closure, it is always just, it's seen in the first three seconds and it does not persist throughout the period of the eyes closed state. It's very clear here, yeah. So we've finished almost all the EEG based questions, clinical questions we will not be taken, taking up here. And uh, thank you, Dr. Ram, uh, for this excellent talk. Uh, I request all the participants to continue to attend and become members of the Indian Epilepsy Society. And I request concluding comments from Professor Mandy Ratha. Sir? Okay. Uh, excellent. And uh, we had quite informative session. And uh, again, emphasizing these, in addition to this, lectures do practice EG reading. EG reading usually is 20 to 25 minutes. Sometimes it may take more time to read it compared to the ECG. So, and always uh, clinical correlates with electrophysiological correlates. And as there are some syndrome, which are clinical electrophysiological syndromes should be kept in mind. So with this, I'll sincerely thank uh, RS Menon all the delegate participants who are actively engaged in this EG workshop, again, requesting to register for our joint annual conference, uh, which is a feast of uh, academics in epilepsy. And uh, also wish to thank Laranon for uh, sponsoring, the, sponsoring the platform and also on regular basis, helping us to carry on this EG webinars. So we uh, also request uh, all of them to yeah. submit their abstracts because the abstract submission is on and the yeah, registration is still an early bird rate. Yeah, abstract uh, date has been, abstract submission date has been extended. Do avail it and uh, join us. We all will be, and you will like this is a very high end cultural and heritage city in addition to the academic component which we are designing. Thank you so much. Have a wonderful time. Good night. Thank you, Ram. Be, thank, be, you, sir. Th thank you, Ram. Bye-bye. Good, Good night, night, sir. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Bye. Bye, Ram.